uh, we, uh, uh, I would now like to call the meeting is now open to the public online. Pafajarov Elig, Agus Nolikhanadev. Um, just like to welcome you all here this morning. Wish everyone a happy Christmas, and um, we will proceed then with our meeting. Can I welcome members who are participating by video conferencing this morning to allow us to maintain the social distancing guidelines? And this morning, uh, that is Chiara uh, is joining us online, and Jerry Carroll uh, online there as well. So thank you, members, and I'd like to remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. Thank you. Um, we've received no apologies today, and um, going then, members, to matters arising. There are no matters arising today. Uh, members, the purpose of today's meeting is uh, the Minister uh, is here today, the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer are both here today to brief the Committee on developments in relation to COVID-19. I refer members there to tabs 4.1 and 4.2 of your pack, which are new items of correspondence relevant to the pandemic. Can I also refer members to tab 4.3 to tab 4.10 of the pack, where there are several items of correspondence previously noted by the committee, but which have been included for members' information today. The official report from the last meeting with the Minister is at tab 4.11. So I'd now like to welcome to our, to our meeting Minister uh, Robin Swan, Minister of Health, and Dr Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer. Um, so I'm just checking. Computer. Just, just could I ask everyone who's online, actually, if you're not speaking, um, to please keep your phone on mute. If you have access to headphones, that would probably be better. And if I could ask um, broadcasting to bring the minister into the, sp into the spotlight, I think that's now in place. So, uh, can you hear us there, Minister? I can, Chair, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, also welcome uh, Michael, Chief Medical Officer Michael McBride. But uh, do you want to go ahead? I I'm not seeing Michael, uh, Chief Medical Officer. Uh, name on screen here at present, Minister, but do you want to go ahead and start the briefing and hopefully we will be joined by the Chief Medical Officer? Uh, certainly, Chair. I'll make, a, I suppose, just a brief, uh, brief opening statement. And I suppose this thanks for yourself, Chair, for facilitating this meeting. I know the last meeting we had where we supplied the update on the vaccine programme, which was very relevant at that point in time. Uh, we did run out of time, so that's why I, would, I appreciate the opportunity to come back. Uh, so, just as ever, again, thank you for the opportunity to update the committee. Minister, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, Minister. It's a wee, a bit hard to hear you. I'm wondering, is there any way you can increase your volume at all? And we're also not seeing you at present. That may be just a question of video not being uh, yep. switched on. Uh, we have been joined now by Chief Medical Officer on screen. So, it's just a wee bit hard to, to hear you there, Minister. If you can do anything about the volume, please. Is that any clearer, Chair? I think it is, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, as, as I was saying, it's a last briefing in December. No we've, no, we've lost you again, Minister. We've lost you again. We've lost you again there, Minister. I'm back in there. Okay, I'm just going to pause for uh, maybe, well, I'll actually ask Broadcasting to see if they can look at that issue of feedback. It is, it is coming through. It's not coming through as feedback into the room, but it's leaving you very, very unclear. So, to be fair, we'll try to get that improved. Um, at this point in time, we would sometimes be looking at switching off video, but obviously that's already done. Do you have access to a headset, Minister? I have here. Is the mic muted as well? Pardon? Michael muted. And can I just check then with Chief Medical Officer that you're on mute? Because I know you've recently joined and you may still be um, feeding through. So if you can just check if you can just check that you're on mute there, please. Yes, I have He definitely noticed the last meeting that when I was coming remotely when I wasn't on mute. It definitely was affecting other people's that's it. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. Sure, just while we're paused, could I raise another issue? No, we're still we're still on until, uh, this is finished. We are still online. I think we we'll, will we'll actually pause a couple of minutes to try to get the, the sound quality cleared up. So we will take a, a short pause. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, members, so we're resuming. We can see you on screen now, Minister, so could you maybe go ahead and try that again and see if the headphones um, help the situation? Thank you. Um, again, thank you, Chair. I think turning off and coming back in again was maybe beneficial in this connection. Uh, no, Chair, I, I had him by saying, you know, I just want to thank yourself and the committee for, for reconvening because I know the last time we met when they gave an update um, on the vaccines, we did run out of time in regards to what we were actually given in that last briefing on the 3rd of December. Um, as the committee will be aware, I, I think this is my 12th attendance um, since, since we came back on, on the 11th of January. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we know facing this pandemic, we still have a, a high rate of new cases and still sadly daily deaths. Uh, Chair, the executive, as, as you're aware, aware, took the, the very difficult decision on Sunday uh, to limit Christmas bubbles to one day and last week um, agreed to recommend tighter restrictions for a six-week period uh, with an even stricter one-week period starting from Boxing Day. Chair, as I said to the ad hoc committee yesterday, none of these decisions were taken lightly. Uh, we all want to spend time with our loved ones at Christmas, particularly after the year that we've had. Uh, um, the, my executive colleagues and myself are no different. Uh, but as the Chief Scientific Advisor stated last week, if we allow this virus to proceed in an uncontrolled way, there, there will be very se severe consequences uh, uh, and uh, further deaths. The tough decisions had to be made in order to protect life and to protect uh, the health and social system, which cannot continue to deal with rising demand. And while increasing hospital capacity could allow us to manage an increase in the ep epidemic, it would inevitably have an impact on healthcare related outbreaks and community outbreaks. So that's why we said, you know, if no action had been taken, our modelling had suggested over two and a half thousand people uh, would need a hospital bed by the end of January. So decisive action had to be taken. Uh, and as you will be aware, um, phase one of the, the COVID 19 vaccination programme began a fortnight ago. Um, at Belfast RVH, where vaccinators were invited to receive their first dose of the vaccine. Uh, a mobile team from, from the Belfast Trust also visited a care home that day and vaccinated the residents and staff. Uh, the department, and in particular Patricia, has worked closely with MRHA to develop a, a deployment model uh, that takes into account the unique characteristics uh, of this vaccine, and that included the transport requirements and is designed to ensure the integrity and efficacy of the vaccine and that's maintained throughout uh, that period. This is a huge achievement and meant that Northern Ireland was uh, leading the way across the UK by vaccinating those who had been recommended by the JCVI as the number one priority to receive the vaccine. Uh, Chair, just to provide uh, an, an update uh, of where we are, uh, in our vaccine programme. As a close of play yesterday, um, 309 care homes had been vaccinated. That's over two thirds uh, of all homes. 7,311 care home residents have received the first vaccine dose. That's over 50% uh, of residents and 8, over 8,600 care home staff um, have been vaccinated as well. Uh, and overall, there have been 
just over 20,000 vaccines administered uh, up until the close of play yesterday. And I expect that figure to continue to grow uh, quite rapidly. And that will do so because uh, trusts now have their vaccination sites in operation and substantial numbers of staff will be vaccinated in the coming days and weeks. Uh, trusts actually plan to run these clinics up to 5 p.m. on the 24th of December and then we'll reopen again on Sunday the 27th. Uh, ultimately, all health and social care workers will have the opportunity to be vaccinated, which is expected to be completed within the first quarter of next year. And chair members will be aware that there, there have been a, a very small number of suspected adverse reactions uh, to the vaccine. It's not unknown uh, for vaccines to produce allergic reactions in a small number of cases. And we will continue to be guided by MHRA on the safe and effective deployment of the vaccine. And subject to the availability of a civil vaccine from early January 2021, it is intended to roll out the, our program through primary care led vaccination clinics, which will be responsible for the vaccination of the mass majority of eligible individuals aged 50 years and over. GPs are planning to swiftly work their way down through the eligible cohorts, starting with, with the oldest first. And the impact of the vaccination program should become apparent uh, at the end of February, beginning of March. Uh, Chair, there's been a lot of discussion uh, over the last few days about the variant strain of the, of the virus. Further analysis and investigation is, is still ongoing in order to understand the characteristics and therefore the potential impact um, of this variant. Analysis to date suggests that the variant may be more transmissible, uh, but it's still uh, too early to confirm that with certainty. However, there is currently no evidence uh, to suggest that the variant is more likely to cause serious disease. There's also currently no evidence that this strain will cause a more serious illness or that it will fail to respond to the, vaccine, the vaccines uh, that we are currently delivering. So I'd urge the public to, to act on the assumption that it's already present in Northern Ireland and that the person they pass in the street or stand next to in a queue may have it. Chair, uh, as you, you have often repeated yourself, we protect ourselves from uh, this new strain through the same methods we use to protect ourselves from the start of this pandemic. And yet again, I would remind everyone of the need to keep your distance uh, and significantly cut our, our contacts with others, uh, wear a face covering and wash your hands. Uh, and if you have symptoms, please self-isolate and get a test. Uh, and test them will be available through the Christmas period. Uh, and Chair, I'm happy to, to take members' questions or, or comments. Okay, thank you, Minister. And, um... I do welcome I do welcome that news in relation to the administration of the vaccine. That does seem to be a fairly substantial increase in that, and that's that's to be welcomed. And also, I'd like to welcome the uh, the consultation on the mental health strategy that that was that was recently launched. That's also a very welcome. Uh, a very welcome development, and also to acknowledge the very, very uh, hard work of yourself and your, your leadership team and everyone involved in, in the health service over a very sustained period of time. And obviously, we're very conscious we're heading into what could be a difficult and a challenging Christmas and beyond. So, um, in, in relation to the, the new variant, you have indicated there that the analysis is ongoing into the potential impact. So effectively, we know that, that there is a fire raging in terms of this new variant and the spread in, in parts of the southeast of England. Um, and we also know that, in, in a sense, given how very close our health services here have come at, at, in, in recent times to, uh, to being overwhelmed, and we have seen car parks with ambulances and, and medical staff having to go out to ambulances and that. So can you, Minister, advise... in? And we have also seen very, very quick action from a number of European countries in light of the fact that this variant seems to be more transmissible, in light of the fact that it is unknown about the, the extent to which that might impact us. What is your assessment of the potential impact of allowing travel to continue into, into and, and further spread of this variant of the disease here? What's the likely impact of that on health services in the, these very critical early weeks of January? Um, thanks, Chair. And, I, no, and again, thank you for the opportunity to, I suppose, update colleagues as, as to 
actually the discussions and the decisions that the, the executive um, has taken. Um, there has been, I suppose, partial coverage of discussions that have ha were had last night uh, due to an ongoing problem that I've often made. Uh, and that's the leaking of uh, discussions within the executive on, on papers as well. So the, the proposal in, in regards to, to what we've actually asked uh, to do last night, uh, we brought to, to the executive uh, a paper, uh, which based on the view of where we saw uh, the new variant uh, in England, but also a rise in cases in the Republic of Ireland, uh, that we felt we should immediately issue guidance advising against all but essential travel uh, between Northern Ireland and GB and the Republic of Ireland uh, with an immediate effect. And then again, uh, further guidance that that should include asking all new arrivals to self-isolate uh, for 10 days. And that's, that, that, that clarity was discussed uh, around what that actually means at the executive for their, uh, on this morning and that further guidance. Uh, will come out on those specific issues. But, but to be clear, Chair, why um, we moved to issuing guidance advising against that bond is because um, I think as we were and as members were aware, uh, we had committed to go and seek further um, updates from the Attorney, the Attorney General on what we could do and in regards to the advice that came back from her. Uh, so in parallel uh, to issuing that guidance, what we also asked um, from the executive uh, and colleagues as well, was to provide that sense of clarity as regards as to what we will classify as essential. Um, also, that we, um, as a department, and we've started that, uh, would actually urgently undertake the preparatory work uh, to form any necessary changes um, that we need to make to legislation actually to implement a ban on travel uh, and the associate um, the associated consideration of proportionality and human rights compliance, because that is one of the things that the, the Attorney General did raise and, and her feedback to us was that of proportionality of compliance in regards to EU uh, legislation on the European Court of Human Rights legislation. Uh, also conscious of the time it would actually take to bring about a ban, a legal ban of, of travel. So further steps that the executive agreed to take last night and that are being pursued now by various departments in the executive office is to seek uh, that reassurance from UK government that they will robustly enforce their own tier four restrictions in regards to who ca can travel to Northern Ireland, uh, which will themselves will curtail, you know, actually travel across uh, across the water as well. And we're also looking at, the, and I mentioned this yesterday at the Ad Hoc Committee, was the use of the locator forms uh, for travellers arriving into Northern Ireland. That would also pick up uh, any traveller coming into Northern Ireland and then transferring through to the Republic of Ireland. And we, we, we would open the, you know, and, and set up the, the measures where we can share that information. Uh, but in regards to the proportionality of the thing, uh, the biggest challenge um, that we had in, in bringing forward uh, an immediate uh, action in regards to the ban on, on travel and stop, not meant stopping airplanes on, on ferry was, was the, the implications, uh, both financial, but also to our supply chains here in Northern Ireland in regards to to food um, and medicines. So I, I thought it was useful, Chair, just to, to set out the, the entirety of the picture because I do know there has been, a, I suppose, a potted version of what decisions were actually taken last night and conversations that we, we actually had. So we have moved in regards to um, what is uh, a threat of the new, new variant. Um, uh, of, of the 6,000 positive cases, uh, and I think I said this yesterday as well, you know, of the 6,000 positive cases over the last 14 days coming in from uh, GB, 23 of them, uh, 23 of them were from GB, so um, the, the, I suppose the proportionality of all our, po our positive cases there has to be taken into consideration as well, and that was very much uh, some of the feedback we were getting from the Attorney General was about the proportionality approach in regards to introducing an immediate travel ban, so that's why we moved uh, to immediately issue that guidance on advising all but uh, essential travel between um, here and, and, and anywhere else. Thank you, Minister. And I, and I do understand that there would be certainly uh, significant consequences which would have to be dealt with in relation to a travel ban. However, most other countries in Europe appear to have 
weighed that risk and decided that the, the, it was essential to move quickly. And I suppose, again, linking back to that, uh, that the, the, the fact that this is raging in, you know, in England, that every plane that comes here potentially is carrying sparks, which could, which could seed further spread here. And I, I, think I, I think I gather from what you've said there that the Attorney General has indicated that you did have, you, you would have, and do have the power to legislate. But you're considering the impacts of that. But are you not concerned that potentially the stable, the, we, we could be closing the stable door after the horse is bolted, given the scenes we have seen in train stations and, and airports across the, across the, the across various places? Chair, you know there there is no doubt, you know, and according to the AG, yes, we do have the power, but it has to be taken uh, in proportionality, and it also in that proportionality assessment is input from uh, all our executive colleagues uh, and and the executive office itself. Now, all that work I listed, you know, the actions that we were taking, all that work started uh, this morning, uh, coordinated by the new head of, of the civil service through the COVID. The, the COVID task force, but in regards to you know what steps we were taking, and that about that that immediate uh, guidance, advising all uh, against all but essential travel between Northern Ireland uh, and GB in the Republic of Ireland, but also the ten day isolation period chair as well to make sure if there is, uh, and I think as you described, you know if there is somebody that's carrying one of those sparks, that ten day isolation period is the same for this new variant as it is for, for the coronavirus that we've been fighting since earlier this year. So due to the incubation period, if any spark did arrive uh, and people are self-isolating for that period of time, it would extinguish that spark to follow on with your analogy. An an analogy. OK, Minister, I'm going to move on to, to members because I want to give members an opportunity to um, get get some uh, questions in. And, and it's very welcome that you have given this, this uh, session in order to, to focus in some detail on some more of the issues. So I'll go to members. I will uh, suggest to members that if you wish to you know, do a question and a follow-up, I'll try to allocate the time out. It's, it's approximately seven or eight maybe minutes at this point in time. You can either go with a question and a follow-up or a couple of questions. You can manage your own time in that sense. If you feel that the question is not being answered in a way that you had, uh, actually were hoping for, um, either indicate to me or, or indeed to, to the Minister that you, that you want to refocus that. And if Minister and Chief Medical Officer, if I could ask you to facilitate in the sense that if one of you could lead on an answer, and then if there's a, an additional piece of information, significant information that one of you want to contribute, but if one of you could kind of uh, lead, on, lead on, on the substance of the answer, so that we get the maximum value out of our, out of our time this morning. So thank you for that, members. I'm going to go across, first of all, to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. I'll now go to Paula, and then I have both Cara and Arlea indicating, and then Jerry indicating on the phone, and then I'll come back into the room here. So I'll start off with uh, Pam. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, and um, Michael McBride for your attendance here at the committee today. And just, I suppose, while I have the opportunity, I just want to say um, a huge thank you to, to both of you for um, what I know has been an incredibly difficult year uh, for both of you and also for um, Ian Young. And we do appreciate the massive efforts that have been put into uh, in order to try and keep uh, the population safe here in Northern Ireland. And I want to also extend that to actually all executive members, because we know there have been very, very difficult decisions have been taken this year. Um, most of them very unpopular. Most of them none of us like. Uh, but we understand why why that has been the case. But so I just want to put on record my thanks to you. Um, I have a I have a number of questions, um, but just very quickly wanted to ask first of all around shielding. Minister, you had promised yesterday that that advice would be coming from um, Dr McBride, so I don't know if, if, if Michael wants to lead on that now and, and give. Obviously, there's over 200,000 people in Northern Ireland who were originally issued shielding letters, and those people remain very, very concerned about where they go from here and how they can be protected. And some of them have children going to school, some of them uh, still have to go to work. Um, and they really do need this shielding advice. So if you could give us that, um, first of all, that would be very welcome, and then I'll ask you some other questions. Uh, Chair, if Michael's still on there, he could lead on that specific. Yep. yep. Go, go ahead, and very welcome. Very welcome this morning, Chief Medical Officer. Go ahead, please. 
Thanks, to, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, thank you, Pam, for your kind comments at the at the outset as well. Uh, just indicates that, subject to the minister's uh, agreement, we'll be issuing further guidance to those clinically extremely vulnerable, previously known as shielding, later this afternoon. Uh, we, I would want to reassure everyone that the measures that we have put in place, the steps that you are taking, the rest of the population are taking uh, to date, are keeping you safer. Um, those same measures uh, are the same measures that will keep us all safe and you safe uh, from this new variant of the virus. But that further information will be uh, released uh, and you will be advised of that later today. Okay, and how will that information be made available? In the time frames, uh, it will not be possible to send out individual letters. Uh, we will be putting that advice on the department's website and obviously using social media and a range of other means uh, to communicate the advice, including the NIH Direct website. Thank you. That's great. Okay. So I'm going to move on to, um, I want to ask around the workforce um, appeal and ask if um, the number or rate of appointments, if whether that has changed since the 25th of November, first of all. Um, I'll give an update um, for the workforce appeal. Um, the new appeal itself, uh, Palmer, the overall appeal, you want the, the new appeal went live uh, early October. The uh, number of new applications received as of the 16th of December uh, was 6,891. Uh, that was 3,719 health and social care applications. Uh, and the total number of appointments to date uh, is over 600. Uh, the appeal has also recently commenced work on recruiting for the vaccination programme. And to the 16th of December, the appeal has generated 1,094 formal applications from healthcare professionals. Okay, so that has gone up then since 25th of November. It has increased, those numbers have increased. Yeah. That's yeah. good, because I'm sure you would agree, Minister, that it's entirely unacceptable that, that there were only 6% of applicants had been appointed by that stage at 25th of November. It seems a very low um, figure. Um, I'm just wondering, how did that figure compare with similar initiatives across other regions? I, I wouldn't have that 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 data to, to date uh, or to hand, Pam. But we, we can't get it for you. But just to be clear, you no know, candidates, uh, those who who may not who may have applied or may not be successful, might not have been offered posts for for a variety of reasons, um, actually such as suitability or the availability of the candidates when they were offered a position actually still being um, available to take that up. Or for example, even it was common for candidates only being able to commit uh, to specific hours or specific days, uh, which unfortunately didn't match the demands of the positions that were being offered because the workforce appeal was really to, you know, to plug some of the gaps that we saw in our workforce appeal as well. Okay, I do understand that. I would appreciate if we could get some more detail around that and breakdowns of, um, you know, where exactly those applications um, were heading towards and and, uh, and and reasons for why many of them weren't appointed or, or why that didn't work. I mean, it's. Um, I, th I think we, we've talked a lot over over time around contact tracing uh, and around the need to ensure that there is sufficient capacity for contact tracing. I think that's even more vital in light of this new variant. So I would be concerned that we still don't have enough people in place and I think we should be looking at every opportunity and whether that's uh, giving contracts to people who don't fit the, the bill in terms of which day or which hours. I think it's kind of all hands on deck at this stage. We really need everybody involved there. So I would appreciate if we could get the breakdown of that information. Um, Sorry, just to come in there, and I think that's where you know our the banking staff system that we have in TTP actually works because it allows us that greater pull uh, to pull on when we do have that. You know, and it's a piece of work that's already been going on. You know, contact tracing will be operational uh, over the Christmas period. It's even going to be operational on Christmas Day, uh, and one of the things we've actually been looking on and PHA have been putting in place is should we see what we thought was going to be the expected spike um, even if these measures weren't brought into place you know we are scaling to a point that we'll be able to to to, to meet the demand uh, that that peak will bring. I think that is important Minister and have you looked at the um, comparing again the Welsh model with what we're doing here given uh, on the back of the the uh, spotlight I think or 
yeah, I think it was Spotlight, um, did that programme, and it was very clear that the Welsh model were, were very good at following up, whether that was by using the technology to kind of uh, uh, get, get responses back, and then moving to humans, making calls to check that people were actually self-isolating, and in fact, if there's no response, then actually going out and looking for those people to see that they are, one, okay, and two, actually doing what they're meant to be doing in terms of self-isolation. And, and looking after themselves. Have you had any further consideration on, on the uh, around the policy of, of how the contact tracing is working at present? Well, I, I think as we said the last time, we're always looking, you know, about how we take the next step um, in contact tracing. We continue to progress the implementation um, of the hybrid model, you know, the one you're referring to, and that's the focus on further digital de- solutions, even to deliver early messages to contacts and cases. Um, and at the same time allowing the professional staff and the contact tracing service uh, to do those risk assessments and deal with the more complex cases, you know, like clusters uh, and outbreaks as well. But we've also, and I think I've said this at a previous meeting, you know, that enhanced contact tracing service uh, going back seven days, you know, that started on, on the, the 16th of November. You know, our, our contact tracing team always looks to, to what works elsewhere and what has been done elsewhere. Uh, and I know the Welsh model of contact tracing has been uh, has been used, and I think was used. And I, I didn't see the I didn't see the actual TV program. But one of the things, you know, when we when we compare how effective uh, you know, operations are, we always need to be cognizant of of the results. Uh, that each system is having as well and, and the number of contacts uh, that it can make uh, and does make. You know, our, our own service um, I, I, between 13th and 20th of December reached 96% of contacts uh, within 24 hours of the positive case being identified and um, being referred to the service and then 98% were reached uh, within 48 hours. So, you know, our, our level of contact uh, is above some of the other nations as well. And, you know, com- at, at, when, when we you know, look to some of the other comparisons in Wales, um, we are performing at a, a better level. Okay. And just finally, I know I'm probably pushing a wee bit here. Um, in terms of the vaccination, I really welcome the figures that um, you've given us today. It's very, very good news um, for care home residents in particular. So I really very much welcome that. Could you just give us the dates again that the vaccine will be, uh, the vaccination process is pausing for? How, what were the dates that it won't be happening over Christmas? Uh, it is. We will, we will be pausing on, on Christmas Eve and starting up again on the 27th. Um, but again, we'll still be able to make sure that we're utilising uh, full capacity. Uh, over those days as well, uh, because at that point, post the 27th, we will begin into our second phase um, of vaccinations as well, um, because we actually deployed um, on the 8th of December. So when we get to the 29th of December, we'll be into that second round of vaccinations with the three weeks being in between. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And actually, Minister, I'd just actually take you back there to my own question, because I, w- I was thinking back over it, and I don't think really I got a clear answer in relation to what modelling you have in terms of the impact on our health service into January, um, and given, given that we haven't legislated to stop that, trans- that travel issue at the present time. What modelling have you in relation to the impact that may have on delivery of health services in the early weeks of January? Uh, we haven't done any updated modelling on uh, that chair uh, because we still need to see the transmissibility uh, in regards to to that particular strain as well, and also in regards to the immediate issue of guidance that we have advised against anybody uh, doing the essential pe- travellers uh, should come into Northern Ireland and they should isolate for ten days as well, because we also in, the, in regards to modelling we have to see the effectiveness. Um, of the six-week intervention that's about to start on the 26th of December as well. Okay, I'm going to go then to Paula. Paula, please. Okay, um, thank you, Minister, and thank you, Chief Medical Officer, for being here today. Um, Just a a quick question to start off with, Minister. Um, The recommendation around the 10 days of self-isolation that the Executive agreed to last night, is that going to be in guidance or is that going to be written into regulations? 
It will be in guidance at, at this point in time because that's where the, the guidance is following on from essential travel. But as I said, we are developing uh, what the legislation would look like uh, should the executive decide to implement a, a travel ban. Um, so it will all form that, uh, I suppose, a, a greater package when we get the, the results of all the other uh, work streams that are being taken forward by the COVID task force. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, the next question was in relation to the announcement um, that you were going to reimburse the nurses for their um, pay from the strikes this time last year. Can you confirm whether they got that, those, um, that additional money paid back in their December wages? Um, I, I can't confirm it, but I do know that um, I actually had a, a meeting with the business service or, organisation uh, and all their leads on Friday, just again to acknowledge the work that they have been doing. Uh, in the background during the pandemic as well. And they were hopeful that the majority of that strike pay should be reimbursed um, actually in the December payroll. And if it's not in the December payroll, it will definitely be paid uh, in January. Uh, BSO have confirmed that we did meet the deadline uh, for processing in December. Uh, but just in the number of individuals and the number of changes that have to be made, um, they are hopeful it will be there in December pay packets, but if definitely not, it will definitely be there in January. Thank you, Minister. Um, the next question is in relation to, we had a presentation here at Health Committee very recently there from the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, and um, uh, we were advised that there was a business case that's been put forward to your department around sort of tra um, the transformation agenda, and I think that was $30 million over five years of just I would appreciate if you could give us an update on, on the sign-off of that business case. Um, thanks, but that, that business case hasn't come to to me as of yet. It's not on my desk. I'm aware of the presentation um, that has been made in the detail went in there because we know the long-term uh, investment in the ambulance service is something that we need to take seriously in regards not just to equipment but staff as well and the work that needs to be done to to support them so it, it is it has been submitted it hasn't come my length yet for assessment or sign off okay and, and f finally minister um, you mentioned in the chamber yesterday around um in response to a question for me around the long COVID, the sort of the um, package of measures that's been put in place could you give us a, an update on where that is please thank you chair if you don't mind i'll ask the chief medical officer to pick up on that specific yeah certainly uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, and thank you for the question. The Minister um, had directed that a piece of work is taken forward to develop a service specification uh, which would deliver uh, in keeping with the new published NICE guidance, which, as you can recall, were published last week, where it set out a set of standards in relation uh, to those individuals who experienced uh, a longer term or medium term effects from COVID. Uh, that has currently been considered within the department and we'll be engaging with Commissioner colleagues in terms of developing a specification uh, for the requisite support. Clearly, it will require multidisciplinary input uh, across uh, a range of, of specialist services, uh, including uh, a range of professional uh, professions from other backgrounds. Um, thank you. Just finally, then, I just want to wish you both a happy Christmas, and I hope you are able to get some rest over the festive period. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula. And I'll go then across on the phone lines on the on video conferencing to Cara Hunter. Go ahead, Cara. Chair, uh, and I thank you, uh, Minister and Michael, for being here today. I always find your briefings um, extremely helpful in seeking clarification. Um, you know, we recognise the difficult job that you have, uh, and especially during Christmas and getting the public to adhere to regulations. I just have a few questions. One of them would be around um, the training um, of giving vaccinations. I'm mindful we have a population of uh, 1.8 million people. Um, so I'm just curious what steps the department has taken on this matter to ensure that we have an adequate, uh, adequate work workforce uh, to tackle the virus through mass vaccination. Chair, I'll let the Chief Medical Officer pick up on that, if it's OK with you. Yeah, certainly. Go ahead, uh, Michael. Uh, Cara, thank you, and, and uh, congratulations on your appointment to the to the committee. If I might be allowed to say that, um, we have an extensive program uh, of uh, vaccination uh, vaccinators underway. That includes the peer, peer vaccinators over 900 peer vaccinators within our trust, but also uh, additional volunteer vaccinators who have all gone through an extensive online training program. It's a 18-hour online training program. 
uh, all individuals that are required to have updates in relation to CPR, um, dealing with um, anaphylactic reaction, uh, etc. So there's extensive training and supervision and sign off of those individuals, because as you're absolutely correct, it's important that this is a new vaccine and it's important that those vaccinating uh, have all the requisite skills to ensure that those uh, vaccines can be administered safely. Um, and in the majority of cases, we know that's uneventful, but sometimes uh, individuals do have reactions to vaccines. So I, I can assure you that that is in place. We also have a series of safety checks, uh, which are put in place time uh, a vaccine session begins, where staff go through uh, the routine, uh, and also a series of questions uh, which are asked of individuals as they book uh, a, a, a vaccine. So, 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 for instance, that we avoid individuals who may have a previous risk or high risk of anaphylactic reaction from getting uh, the uh, Pfizer vaccine. And then there are specific questions uh, where the vaccinators again go through uh, that checklist with the individuals who are presenting for vaccination. Thank Cara, you very just, much. I, I know we are, uh, sorry, Chair, maybe just to come in as well, but you know, I had a meeting yesterday with uh, community pharmacy who are also mad keen to be part of our vaccination program as well mm -hmm. you know, they step forward in, in our flu vaccine program so they want to be part of the overall response as do our gps as well in primary care so the more vaccine we get available you know our health service our health family are really stepping up to to deliver this and, and you know they see the benefit that it will bring Thank you very much. Um, and just on that, um, I know the public uh, have heard uh, about pregnant women who receive uh, the vaccine that there can be um, that some are apprehensive, especially they've also mentioned that some young women after receiving the vaccine shouldn't conceive within three months. Uh, Michael, this might be a question for yourself, just around if you have any further clarity. I know I know the public are very curious on this matter. Yeah, I mean, I think with any new vaccine, we're always just cautious. And the fact of the matter is we don't have any evidence of any uh, cause for concern in pregnancy or in women who are planning pregnancy. But again, the precautionary principle applies in medicine and in, and in health that until we have evidence that the uh, vaccine can be safely administered uh, in pregnancy, we are advising, advising all of those who are pregnant uh, not to be vaccinated or those who are planning at pregnancy. But that is purely a precautionary measure at this time until we get further data. Fantastic, thank you. Um, just two more questions. Um, I'm just wondering if you foresee uh, any changes in January um, with uh, a travel limit, something similar to what we've seen in the South previously in the year, around a five kilometre limit. And lastly, um, I've been lobbied by constituents over the past 24 hours, just around looking more clarity uh, on the curfew uh, and how that will work. Thank you. Um, thanks, Car. In regards to, and if you don't mind, I'll maybe answer the two questions together because it's part of the conversation was actually had um, at the executive this morning in regards to the curfew uh, between the 26th of December and 2nd of January. And it's a discussion around what regulation is needed to be brought in uh, to make it or en en enable uh, the police actually to enforce it or stop people. So that conversation again is ongoing. It's part of um, the, a follow up from this morning's meeting that's been led again by the COVID task force under the compliance uh, working group. So so we should hopefully get uh, an update uh, on it uh, as, as soon as possible so that people understand their responsibilities, but also so the police know exactly what powers they bring. Uh, in regards to to the curfew over that week's period, it's really about us driving home, I suppose, the seriousness of where we see this six week intervention and doing all that we can uh, to make sure that it gets into people's mindset of how important this is, but also being aware of, you know, the opportunities of between that Christmas period and over New Year's, the opportunities for house parties and things like that. So it's really about limiting uh, the opportunity for for the, those events that would bring more people together and more un, unregulated and uncontrolled uh, venues would receive further spread of the virus. Is that, is, that, is that okay? Sorry, that... No, that's great. That's both answered. Um, just to thank you both for, for making yourselves so readily available to us uh, and to have a lovely Christmas. Thanks, Carl. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, going then, still on the video conferencing facility, uh, if broadcasting could bring Orlea Flynn. Um, uh, and can you go ahead there, Orlea, please? Yes, thank you, Chair, and thanks to the Minister and uh, Michael. Um, so, Minister, in your opening um, remarks, you had mentioned that 
so that work is underway to prepare for legislation if if that is required um, at some point and if that, that work started this morning I just wonder if you could elaborate a wee bit more on that and you had also mentioned that when you were discussing this and taking it into consideration around the travel ban that you were conscious of the time that it would take um, to uh, bring about a ban so I know that obviously um, in parts of Britain and in the south and stuff that um, you know some of their bans did um, come into place pretty swiftly so is there you know is there any particular reason why it would take you know it would be a longer process or maybe a more complex process um, for us to make that decision if it's um, the right thing to do thank you right. I suppose early in regards to, and I suppose it's around the utilisation of, of the 67 Act, it's not something we've used uh, previously uh, in regards to enforcing travel. It's not something we have sitting in the shelf ready to lift down, so it is about starting that entire scope and uh, exercise as to what regulation would actually look like. Uh, so some of the things we can move and we are moving on, uh, hopefully especially is that local guidance that we can give police you know to stop people we've seen that uh, being utilized in the republic of ireland uh, and also on wheels as well but you know in regards to to the travel ban itself now i've just received or i'm just seeing an update here that the eu commission uh, has actually said that eu countries have been told to lift their travel bans uh, to the uk to allow essential travel uh, minimize trade disruption so I suppose that actually is in lockstep with uh, what we were recommended to the executive, uh, where we restrict any movement coming from GB or longer term from the Republic of Ireland, that it is um, reflected that it is only for essential reasons uh, to make that. So uh, the, the delay, I, I suppose the delay in bringing about that, that legislation uh, is the fact that we don't have it on the shelf. That's why we had to seek guidance from the Attorney General of the implications that it would have. And then in regards to uh, working with other ministerial colleagues in regards to what their commitment says, what their requirement is, or, or what the effect it would have on their various executive functions uh, and again you know, I, I, I'm not saying it's the reason why it takes a wee bit longer but we are a five party executive so it's not as if we're one party that the Prime Minister says this is what you go and do so we work uh, very much by consensus and that collaboration so it was going to take that time but it's work that we have started this morning within the department and now I think that we've started it we'll continue to do it so that we have it uh, should we need it on a future occasion. Okay, Minister, thank you. And um, you had touched on it just there yourself around the, um, so obviously there, there's concerns around the supply chains that you had mentioned um, that could impact on food and medicines and things like that. So, um, you know, is there evidence showing that if we were to implement a ban that, um, because obviously that would be quite serious if you were looking at food shortages or medicine shortages. I know we've spoke about it in a different context around Brexit. Um, but I'm just wondering, have you, you know, any sort of, you know, stark, you know, facts or evidence on that? Because that would be obviously a worry for yourselves. Yeah, you know, and, and earlier that was that was actually part of the conversation around the executive meeting late last night. But you know, other colleagues were asking those questions. You know, do you have, you know, do you have how much? Do you know how much food? Do you know how many passengers we're talking about? And it was very, it became very evident. I think you know when we didn't have those answers that we could give ourselves when it came to meeting the proportionality criteria for bringing in such a, a travel ban under regulation, you know, it'll be hard to justify at that point. So that's why the executive office, again, under the COVID task force is a way gathering that information um, together because, you know, when it comes to a travel ban, you have two options. You either ban a person or you ban the vessel. Mm -hmm. um, if you ban the, the people, the implication then is, is the vessel, still going to run so as an airplane as an affair is it financially viable for those companies so if we ban the individual rather than the vessel we needed then to ensure that there was some sort of financial support mechanism to ensure that those ferry companies kept running to bring the food to bring the oxygen to bring the medicine supplies so that's why it's a part of that i suppose the greater executive uh, collaboration as to how that would actually be implemented um, rather than just moving straight away to do it Okay, and just finally, Chair, uh, one more question just around. So, I mean, obviously, with the new variant, it is going to have um, a massive impact on the island north and south. And I know we'll have the, the previous MOU in place and stuff like that. But um, it, it, do you think there'll be any um, additional proposals or measures just to try and coordinate the, the north-south working? Because I know you mentioned the passenger 
locator forms and I know your frustration in the chair <sighs> yesterday as well just around yeah. having issues with the data insurance so is there any additional there's um with the south and then just finally just to say happy christmas to you and michael you both get a very well well deserved uh, thank you or, or Leah, thank you. No, look, in, in regards to, uh, I suppose, the working and, and the, the work that we do with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, you know, there was North, North South Ministerial Council uh, on Friday, where again, and as I said yesterday, the frustration was raised uh, about the travel locator forms. Um, the UK health ministers, the four ministers, have a weekly meeting, you know, to update in regards to where uh, to where we we all stand, any concerns that we have. Uh, or any issues that we're just facing as health ministers. Uh, you know, I, I, I've said this before, and I'm not sure I, I've said it to yourselves as a committee, but it's it's one of the most refreshing political meetings I think that I attend. You know, you have an Ulster Unionist health minister, a Scottish Nationalist health minister, uh, Welsh Labour health minister, and uh, an English Tory health minister, and there's no politics in it because it's all about health. Now, one of the things that uh, Matt Hancock has actually done as well is Stephen Donnelly's invited to this meeting, um, which is going to be tomorrow as well, and just in that's in regards to where we are, uh, you know, to give an update on vaccinations, because, uh, you know, as I've said in the past, one of the things that we've actually said to our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, and maybe Michael can follow up on this, when it comes to the deployment of the Pfizer vaccine, if there's any learnings or lessons that we have, we'll give it to them, we'll supply it to them. There's no point of us, um, you know, holding back on that because we want them to roll out as a successful vaccination programme as we are, you know, because it makes sense uh, across this island. So so that work's ongoing. I know Michael spoke to Tony Hillahan, the, the Chief Medical Officer, uh, I'm trying to put things days into weeks now, just when you're having executive meetings at 11 and 12 o'clock at night, they're all running into... I think it was yesterday you met with Michael... Uh, Tony uh, Michael. Uh, yeah. uh, I met with Tony and Ronan Glenn yesterday. Uh, just Mike, Michael, you're a bit, a bit faint. Uh, uh, can you give us just a brief, just a brief update on a br brief addition on that, Michael? Yeah, just, just, just to say that uh, the uh, Tony Hulahan, uh, his team, and my team, we meet on a weekly basis. Uh, we uh, met again a sort of an extraordinary meeting, which we both agreed was warranted, uh, given the emerging situation on the new variant and the potential of implications for us all. Uh, so we had a very detailed discussion uh, about the new variant and the potential implications. Uh, uh, but as I say, Minister is absolutely right. Um, you know, we have been sharing learning uh, as we go uh, throughout this pandemic, uh, and we've made very clear that, and indeed have already shared information with colleagues uh, uh, in the Republic of Ireland in terms of how we got around the logistical challenges of the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine. And as I say, we'll continue to do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so going then on the on the phone again to Jerry Carroll. Go ahead, Jerry, please. Can you hear me okay, Chair? Yes, Jerry, we're hearing you there. Fine, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, yeah, first question, Minister. Um, I understand the neurology core two outcomes report uh, was finalised in October. Um, do we have any date for when that's going to be uh, published, publicised? Um, uh, thanks, Chair. I was just trying to work out what was on your bookshelf there, but I can't, can't see clearly, just in case it's a Christmas reading or something there. Uh, look, in regards, sorry, apologies, and what is a, a, serious, a serious issue, uh, the, the, the patients and families involved you know, are eager, eager to see uh, the publication of the cohort two recall, uh, and I will advise. I expect to make a statement uh, addressing that publication uh, early in the new year to the assembly. Thanks, Minister. Uh, the books are the the left book club, and if you want any reading over Christmas, I'm, I'm happy to, to to send some your way. So, that, thanks for that answer. Um, just just follow up on a different uh, question, Minister. Um, I, re I raised the issue obviously yesterday, um, and you responded around the issue of schools in the ad hoc committee in the assembly. Um, I am deeply concerned um, that yourself and uh, the CMO essentially are, are, are warning uh, schools not to operate on a business as usual approach. Uh, but in, all, in any, <coughs> any real sense of looking at it, they are uh, operating as, uh, as normal, as business as usual. Um, so I'd be very concerned about schools. I mean, how concerned are you that schools and testing centres are going to be safe um, come come January, January 4th and, and thereafter. Uh, uh, 
Can, can I, I'll just uh, separate your last two points there, Jerry, in regards to testing centres. Um, and I'll, I'll repeat the answer that, that I gave yesterday. If anybody's using a school facility or if a school is uh, facilitating uh, testing and in regards to, you know, I think you're talking about the transfer test, it's up to the school and it's up to the Board of Governors, those organising the test and those delivering the test to make sure that they meet all the current regulations in regards to bringing numbers of people together uh, in, the same, in the same location. So the onus is, would, would fall on to the organisers and those who are, who are delivering those uh, to make sure they comply fully with with health regulations, in regards to in regards to schools, um, you know there has been a lot of guidance uh, and updated uh, advice been given to the, educa the Department of Education uh, by the Chief Medical Officer, by the, the Chief Scientific Advisor. Uh, we presented, we we published a paper of non-pharmaceutical interventions, and that was the things that you know can be done uh, prior to a vaccine. Uh, we shared that with with all the executive colleagues back at the end of, of September. We've provided update, updated sage advice in regards to, um, I suppose, reducing the risk in school facilities. Uh, and I know that Michael and Ian have been engaged with departmental uh, officials within education as to how those actually work and what those actually look like. So I don't know if, if Michael wants to update just in regards to the conversations that have been had at a, an official level. No, uh, other than to say that uh, following uh, the agreement at the uh, executive, there has been further engagement between uh, myself and the Chief Scientific Advisor and Department of Education officials. Uh, the advice remains that, as we've said before on many occasions, that it, uh, schools do make a contribution to R. It's difficult to get R much below 0.9 with schools fully open. Um, and the SAGE evidence paper, which was previously circulated to the executive and indeed has informed the discussions with DEE officials, uh, you know, includes a range of options between schools fully opened and schools fully closed, including reduced classroom sizes, alternate day, uh, teaching, a move to online teaching, etc. I think there is no doubt that the emergence of this new variant is concerning. Um, uh, there does seem to be uh, no evidence to date that it's particularly prevalent in any age group or particularly target any age group, but we have seen reports of uh, it's been pr present in quite a number of school age children. And I think we just need to watch that space as to what, if any, the implications. That uh, might be for a return to uh, of school opening uh, in the new year. Th thanks for the answers. Um, I suppose concern, Minister, is that I mean, there's obviously been a lot of discussion in the last few days about restrictions on uh, households with Christmas and, uh, and everything associated with it. But there, there's not the same level of focus or concern being raised in terms of the minister, the education minister's actions in re in regards to. Uh, the virus spreading in schools and test centres, as you said, in relation to the the um, uh, the eleven uh, the transfer test. Um, just how does this happen in terms of you make a recommendation, presumably to the executive and to the education minister? Is the onus on him to ensure that uh, the advice is adhered to, followed up on, or is there a vote on the executive? Just if you could give us a sense of how that how that happens, and, and obviously it may not get the time. So wish you both a good uh, and safe Christmas and, and break and, and all that. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I suppose in regards to process, uh, we can provide advice and clarity uh, in regards to the recommendations that are included in those papers, you know, the SAGE paper, the MPI paper, as to what further steps can be introduced in schools. Um, I was, you know, the Minister of Education has the responsibility uh, for schools and the delivery of the education programme. So um, we can provide advice and guidance, and we do. And then how that is implemented is uh, through his department, through the Education Authority, uh, and through schools. But that advice and guidance we'll always provide. Um, 
at, I was I was going to say we'll, we'll be provided if we're asked for it. We provide it when we're not asked for it. We provide if there is any change uh, and guidance that comes out from under national best practice, uh, we share that with with colleagues. So it comes from uh, the last. And I suppose you're asking there in regards to the executive. I think the last agreement, the executive had the the, the conversation between ourselves and education would continue, and we could provide that update of clarity on any questions that education has and and what certain steps actually mean or how they can be introduced and, and we continue to do that and will continue to do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, going then back, I'm going, coming to first of all to Pat Sheehan, then going to Jonathan and then Alan. So go ahead, Pat. Okay. Uh, first of all, Minister and Chief Medical Officer, I want to wish you Nolly Conady, uh, happy Christmas uh, and season's greetings to both of you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to have a bit of a discussion uh, with both of you uh, around risk assessment, uh, particularly in terms of the recent issue around travel, but also in general terms. Uh, and, and, and first of all, I'd like to know who carries out that risk assessment. So in terms of the, the travel, for example, uh, of, of this week, the issue this week, uh, the virus has been running rampant in southeast England. Uh, Matt Hancock himself said the virus was out of control, yet plane loads of people are flying in here from Heathrow and Gatwick. There are ferries crossing the Irish Sea uh, full of people. Now, the, the level of compliance with the regulations and guidance in, in, in England in particular is quite low. Uh, the, the information we have is that only 18% of people, for example, were self-isolating when they were supposed to be. So if we extrapolate from that that the level of compliance of people in the most affected areas is low as well, we can assume that a number of people were travelling from those areas to airports. So no one was asking them at the airport gate for their postcode, so they were free to move ahead. When they get on the plane, there's a risk that they're passing, if they have the virus, that they're passing it to other people. And when they arrive here, although the guidance is that they isolate for 10 days, no one is enforcing that. No one's checking up on them. They may be getting into buses, trains, taxis. They may decide, even if they're travelling onwards to the south, for example, that they'll spend the day shopping in Belfast city centre. You know, so all of those particular parts of the process are, are risks in themselves. And, and I'd, I'd like to know, first of all, who carries out the risk assessment? And can you explain in sort of layman's terms what that risk is? You know, if we're talking about uh, professions that, that carry out risk assessment, let's say, for example, a boogie, uh, if he has a horse at 100 to 1, you know there's not much chance of it winning. Uh, whereas if it's even money, it has uh, almost one in two chance of winning. And then you have actuaries in the insurance business who carry out risk assessment and, and so on. It just seems to me, given that over 40 countries imposed a travel ban with the UK, that they thought there was a significant risk and we didn't. So can you explain the divergence of thinking there? Um, thanks, Pat, and happy Christmas to, to yourself. Um, uh, and. and in regards to, to that risk assessment, it, it's a piece of work that's brought together by expert. I'm trying to think of the, the, the group itself as our, our expert advisory group that um, Ian and Michael are part of that come forward with those recommendations uh, on papers um, to the executive. Uh, in terms of context in Northern Ireland, um, and this is in the paper that we presented to the executive, associated cases of COVID-19 uh, representative in relative terms, a small percentage of overall cases, it was actually less than 1%. Uh, so for example, the last two weeks of the approximate, and I, I used this before, 6,000 new cases, only 23 have reported travel to the rest of the United Kingdom. So while they've reported, um, you know, being in the United Kingdom, it's not necessarily uh, the, the area where they have uh, contracted COVID, uh, if you understand what I'm saying as well. So in that risk assessment, it uh, comes about then transferring that uh, to proportionality. 
Um, I, I don't think there has been any difference, uh, and then it's actually something the chief scientific advisor informed the executive. Um, there's no difference in the risk assessment uh, as far as he's aware of what is given in regards to the new variant, uh, but it did come back then in regards to policy and how governments interacted and the decisions they were taking, as I said earlier on, you know, in regards to, to what we've now seen where the EU Commission has actually um, instructed other EU countries to lift uh, the travel bans that they have introduced. Yeah, and, and I understand that, and I'm not particularly interested in this conversation around the, the new variant, but the fact that the, the virus is out of control in a particular area where a large number of people are travelling from to here. Uh, you know, and this pandemic started with one person being infected. We're now in a worldwide pandemic. So, I mean, are, are the odds of the virus arriving here on a plane 20 to 1, 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1? Can, can someone quantify what the risk is so that we compare it, can compare that with what other countries are saying? We're not, we're not hearing you there, Minister. You're, you seem to be on mute. All right, sorry. Uh, and that was a very good answer, Pat. Uh, uh, no, look, in regards to, to, to relative risk uh, of travellers from the UK having COVID-19, and as I say, is less, and this was actually in the paper that went to the executive, is less than one in 100, and is significantly less than that uh, for the new, new, new var variant. And that's why we recommended that uh, precautionary approach um, so that's you know specific in regards to to the new variant as well, and, and I know we you know I think one of the things you know you did raise and you raised it in the chamber yesterday, in regards to um, you know people using Belfast then to travel home. Now I've noticed the Irish government uh, have now chartered uh, two aeroplanes and a number of ferries to bring people home. So you know what uh, what would have been a, a certain number of people stretched out over a number of commercial flights are now being. Uh, curtailed into a smaller number of, of chartered flights. So I, you know, I, I would have to look to Ian or Michael to see if that increases risk um, or not of what arrives um, on the island. Um, but you know, the, the decision that we take, we took last night was on the basis of the assessment that was brought forward by CMO and CSA. Okay. And could I just finally uh, more a, a comment rather than a, a question? Uh, I mean. I think the decision not to impose a ban at the time, a few days ago, was the wrong decision. And I'm not sure the decision was made on public health grounds. Uh, but uh, leaving that to aside for a second, um, I quoted Mike Ryan to you in the chamber yesterday, and I'll quote him again today. He says, the greatest error in this pandemic is not the move. Uh, and you should move and have no regrets because the virus will get you if you don't move fast. And having this discussions and consultations and uh, uh, having, having a conversation with this person and that person about what to do is the wrong thing to do in this pandemic. If you're going to move, you need to move fast. We need to stop the virus in its tracks. And if we dilly-dally and dither and delay, the virus is going to come through an open door and it's going to spread. And you know as well as I do, Minister, the virus has arrived here on planes. Uh, the transmission rates are going to rise over the next days and weeks. Make no mistake about that. Jenny. Okay. Sorry, no, and, and thanks, Pat. You know, and uh, again, you know, I, I don't think you and I are, are ever in, on, on, on very different pages in, in regards to this, but um, it's where we are and what we do over the next six weeks from the 26th of December, uh, and even from today, will have a major impact and a major inf influence on where this virus is in Northern Ireland leading into next year until we get the full the full rollout of, of our vaccine program. You know, we, we, we said a couple of a couple of weeks ago, you know, that it get, did provide the hope the vaccination program provided that hope that we need to be looked for. So I'll say it again, you know, let's not abuse or lose that hope. Okay, thank you. Jonathan.
Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister and Chief Medical Officer, for coming to the committee today to answer these important questions. Uh, firstly, I suppose probably we've been watching some alarming news reports uh, in relation to hospital capacity, which have been used largely to justify uh, some of the measures that the executive have put in place. Minister, how worried are you of hospital capacity at present? Uh, very concerned, um, Jonathan, in regards to, to what we have. We've seen hospitals at over 100 per cent capacity, which puts additional strain on stresses um, on not just the system, but also the people working in it. Okay. Um, overall capacity yesterday was at 2,838 beds in use. Ten weeks ago, that figure was 3,680. Can the Minister uh, please elaborate on how then on those figures justification is for, for deeper lockdowns. I'm just I'm interested to hear the thought process behind that. Um, again, Jonathan, I think if you look at the, the bed stats, if you actually, um, if you took them off the I, public dashboard, is that where you got I'm, those? I'm reading off the department website, hospital statistics, inpatient and day case activity, 2019, 2020, and also the dashboard at present. Well, if, if, if you look to the dashboard as well, under the explanation notes at the back and how they calculate the, the number of beds uh, available, uh, there was a change in calculation was made where they actually removed from that overall number those ring fence beds that are used for cardiology uh, and other specialities that aren't open to, uh, I suppose, general surgery or general medicine. Um, so what that dashboard now is, is looks at the available f availability of beds uh, that are there for general medical purposes, uh, and that now unfortunately includes those high number of COVID patients as well. And I suppose one thing always to be cognizant of as well, when you look to the number of the count of those beds, beds are available uh, due to the number of staff there are to staff them not because of the physical bed or mattress that is available. So there's changes in, in how those numbers were calculated. I think by, by listening to the dates that they've used, uh, there was changes in calculation as to what was actually presented on the dashboard and is available from the website to make it a more realistic approach of beds or a more realistic picture of beds that actually are available for normal, um, normal medical purposes on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. How, how many patients are currently occupying the Nightingale, faci Nightingale facility at Belfast City Hospital? Um, if you're talking about the ICU uh, capacity, I don't have that number uh, to, to, to hand. Uh, you know, if, if, and again, I suppose maybe for future committees, if you are looking specific numbers, um, if you could provide them as an update or a, a pre, you know, a prelim to us. We can have those numbers to hand, which would be useful for you. Well, but one well, of the things. Sorry, Minister, I understand well, if you don't have that figure, maybe you better answer the question or be better placed to answer the question. Has it ever come close to delivering the additional 75 critical care beds which was committed to in the surge planning framework? No, because we didn't need to, because uh, one of the things about the surge planning for the Nightingale um, ICU capacity was when we reached the number of patients across Northern Ireland that needed ICU support uh, due to COVID, we would operate and would increase uh, the number of floors that are available on the tower block uh, step by step. We had to do that, and the only way we could do that under the surge plan is actually redeploying all our ICU nurses and anaesthetists uh, from across the entirety of our health service in Northern Ireland. So it is a surge plan, as for worst case, uh, and challenging situations uh, where we can see those ICU bed capacities that are available in our local hospitals no longer being able to cope. Okay, and suppose probably as I'm listening to this and, and understand that you know there is bed space avail available in, in that context, it is indeed worrying that there were on average 5,779 inpatient and daycare beds available across trusts in 2019-2020. Yet yesterday, the total bed count on the dashboard was less than half of that. And I understand, because the Minister is constantly on record as saying this, and I do get this point, that uh, you're, you're on record as saying that you, know, you can build space, but you can't uh, immediately buy or build uh, those medical practitioners, which leads me on to the point in relation to the workforce appeal. And I know that number has increased since the last update of the 25th of November, as to over 600 people now that have been recruited. Uh, 
But I suppose that is still worrying, given that there was over 6,000 applicants. And I think, I think particularly around the case of so total appointments as of 25th of November for nursing, for example, was 27 out of a total of 199. Uh, and medical, there was a total uh, applicants of 39, but only one recruited. I suppose probably uh, this is leading to a lot of concerns as to why the workforce appeal and those people that are uh, potentially could be put to good use have not been used. And you know, and I think I you know answering part of um, the question earlier on to Pam, it's always about making sure that those people who who do apply um, actually fit the criteria and, and meet the specification um, that we need to actually fill. So it's about matching uh, applications of workforce appeal against actually the capacity and, and the gaps that we need to to fill. Uh, we had candidates who were actually seeking uh, permanent employment. Uh, and came through the workforce appeal as well, so they were able to be be redirected. Um, the, the idea of the workforce appeal was about securing that temporary employment uh, and an offer to actually to support trusts uh, um, through through the pandemic. And, and look, let, let's be you know I, I know you have the numbers because I gave you to the you know they're there uh, as written answers to questions that you've you've tabled. And all those appointments have played a vital role. Uh, and assessing the health services, uh, but as you know, as I said, candidates may not have been successful at being offered um, a post or being appointed for a variety of reasons, and that would be suitability and availability of the candidates. And as I said, they may not always match the requirements of the role being offered, uh, and it was common for candidates for only being able to commit uh, for specific hours or specific days, uh, which actually didn't match the demands of the positions that we needed to fill. Okay. And, and finally, Minister, I suppose probably I've tried to, to uh, elaborate on a lot of my points in relation to capacity, of which I, I do have concerns as to, as to how uh, that is reported, given, as you've mentioned, there, there is maybe some ambiguity around some of the figures and how they're interpreted. But what, what, I'm going back in time to the beginning of the pandemic and, uh, and the lockdown measures that were put in place uh, with an attempt to build capacity in the health service. Um, so was the department wrong to focus on procuring additional equipment and building Nightingale hospitals if they knew from the outset that there was a real potential that there wouldn't be enough staff to deliver the extra capacity? And was that a strategic error at that time? Um, sorry, Anna. And I suppose, Johnny, one of the things about being able to manage a pandemic um, through hindsight was not a gift uh, that we were given. Um, so one of the things we did at the start in regards, and you know, I remember sitting in, in front of this committee as well, where the focus was on how many ventilators we had, how many ventilators we were buying, uh, and in the meantime, we were training staff to be able uh, to utilise those ventilators. What we did not know back in February and March was how this virus was acting actually going to manifest itself, how many people were going to have to support through your hospital system or even see coming into ICU. Because you have to put things into context. Back at that point in time, we were looking across um, we were looking across the globe. We were seeing uh, hospitals in Italy where there were people lying on corridors, unable to be treated, unable to be supported. Um, and if we were sitting here today having seen those same situations, uh, having occurred in Northern Ireland. I don't think I'd have been sitting here as minister. But what we did was took the appropriate strategic direction and decision uh, to make sure that we had a health service that was going to be able to to cope with what could have been the, the worst of worst scenarios. But due to the compliance uh, and the interaction and the support of the people of Northern Ireland that we saw during that first lockdown, we did not get into the situation where many other parts um, of the world actually did. And I suppose the most important point is that we get back to that same level of compliance in this next six week, six week period so we don't see those further pressures um, come on our health service. Because one of the things that we've done differently uh, in this wave compared to the first wave, and as that is trying to keep as many of our elective procedures going as is physically possible, uh, it pus it's pushing our system to, to a strain, it's pushing our staff to a strain. That's why we're seeing capacity levels of over over 100% is because we're doing so many of those those routine procedures. Perhaps during the first wave, when we did not know what was happening, we suspended a lot of those, we redeployed staff, we trained staff to make sure that when um, 
uh, those, those high number of cases that could potentially have hit us, um, we would have been prepared for them. But thankfully, we didn't get to that situation. Okay. Thank you, Minister. And I think you'll be aware that it is imperative upon me as, as a member of the Health Committee to scrutinise the decisions that were taken. And I thank you and the Chief Medical Officer for your time and wish, wish you both a, a safe Christmas. Thank Thanks, you. Johnny. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, uh, thank you, Minister. Just uh, at the commencement, I'd like to place in record just the reassurance that has been given by yourself earlier about the uh, successful to date rollout of, of the vaccine programme. Um, Minister, I was going to ask you a question uh, around the, uh, the, uh, the importance of maintaining the uh, supply chain uh, in the Northern Ireland in the event of any travel ban, but Orla had already sort of asked you about that, uh, and you have uh, stated just how important it is. Uh, can I just maybe ask, uh, is it a given uh, that uh, the rest of the executive uh, are, are unanimous? Uh, around the importance uh, of maintaining uh, those supply chains. Another question would be then, do the tier uh, travel restrictions in place in Great Britain offer a degree of mitigation against uh, current uh, travel arrangements facilitating the transmission of the virus into Northern Ireland? And another question on travel. Uh, did the Unexpected imposition by the Republic of Ireland of the 48 uh, hour uh, ban on travel between uh, GB and the Republic carry the potential of creating an additional risk to residents of Northern Ireland given the influx of travellers to the Republic of Ireland forced uh, to use our ports and airports to try and get home? And is the proposed state airlifting? Uh, of Republic of Ireland citizens' home, not really uh, defeating the purpose uh, of their original traffic, uh, uh, travel ban, and in fact, it's, it's maybe in, in some sense making a, a, a nonsense of it. And is the minister aware of any uh, geo tracking or other tactics being deployed in Republic of Ireland to identify the existence uh, of the new variant uh, in the Republic? And Jonathan had asked you a question, Minister, around the Nightingale uh, hospital beds in the city hospital. Uh, can I just put on record that, that I thank God uh, that we haven't had to fill those beds, uh, and, and indeed it is reassuring uh, that they are there uh, if we do uh, need them. And in conclusion, Minister, Pat did uh, mention earlier about a risk assessment, uh, and I'm just wondering. Uh, who did the risk assessment for Sinn Féin back in June? I'd be interested to here, see here. that document. Minister? Um, I, I don't think the, the last question, Alan, is either for me or, or, or Michael. Uh, in regards to supply chains, just going through your, your questions in order, um, yes, we have a concern about our, our supply chains um, in regards to anything that would stop either the, the movement or ferries or aeroplanes because we are reliant but they're the end of a very long supply chain uh, when it comes to some medicines and some medical devices. Um, there's a lot of work has already been done um, preparing for that due to, to Brexit. Um, so a lot of those contingencies are in place. Um, I, I met uh, one day last week, I was down with one of our, our senior, our major pharmaceutical suppliers into Northern Ireland with the chief pharmaceutical officer in regards to what steps have been taken in regards to ensuring uh, the supply of our medicines and medical devices um, you know, post the 1st of January. Uh, part of the concerns that, that were raised were that those smaller suppliers, those smaller manufacturers may not have been already signed up to the trader support scheme. Um, so we were able to raise that at, at, at our departmental level with the DHSC uh, to make sure any of the smaller suppliers across uh, and GB were aware that, that they had a, an implication to do that. So there is, there's a, I suppose, a, a concern around supply chain, but there's a lot of work has been done uh, to ensure that, that we do have that continued supply. Um, in regards to the GB levels and the, the tiering processes, um, the tier four restrictions do within themselves tell people um, not to leave home. Tiers one to three uh, tell people to stay local. So my reading of any of that would be that 
neither local or staying at home, just not involved getting on a, an aeroplane to, to come to Northern Ireland. Uh, so that's why we've put in, uh, and again, that guidance as well for all but but essential travel. Uh, and as I said earlier, one of the, the things that, uh, one of the asks that the executive agreed, one of the pieces of work that has been taken forward is to seek that assurance from um, HMG about the, how and they are enforcing their t tier four restrictions and how that will in, in, in itself uh, curtail travel uh, to Northern Ireland. Um, in, in regards to, to the announcement uh, by the Republic of Ireland in regards to you know, the 48-hour uh, travel ban, um, which you know, and I think I've said this in a couple of answers, I now see the EU suggesting that they should um, actually lift. Um, now, uh, from what I am aware by by speaking to other ministerial colleagues, uh, we didn't have any pre-sight of that. I think FM and DFM, like myself, received a call after it had been announced. Uh, so it left us um, as uh, the funnel or as the avenue again back in, but if there had been more uh, coordination and I suppose conversations, it could have made a difference. In regards to what we're now seeing with the Irish government, you know, chartering planes and chartering ferries, uh, you know, they're, they're bringing back the same people that would have been coming on those commercial flights over the past 48 hours. So I, I, I struggle to see, uh, I, I suppose I, I struggle to see now the benefit uh, in that ban if you're bringing back uh, the same people uh, from the same area, but actually putting them into a, a smaller compact uh, number of aeroplanes on ferries as well, where they will, they will interact. In regards to the, the geo tracking, I, I think maybe you're referring to the, the genomic um, sequencing uh, that, that we complete. Uh, and just, I suppose, as your final question, then I'll pass that over to Michael just to give the detail on what we're doing at a genomic level as part of um, COG UK. Yes, uh, thank you, Minister. Um, and I thank you for the question. Very important that we continue to monitor this virus. I mean, it's been fairly stable. Uh, it hasn't mutated much. We have seven broad variants of the virus since it first arose in, in Wuhan. Uh, and the reason it hasn't mutated much is that it's already well adapted uh, to spread uh, between people. Um, and um, this variant has unfortunately arisen. It is more transmissible. Uh, thankfully, we have no evidence to date, although the evidence is not yet robust, that, that, that it appears any more that causes any more severe disease. And I think more importantly, we have no evidence at this time uh, that it would render the vaccines any more uh, or any less effective, I should say. Um, we are doing more genomic sequencing than any other uh, country in Europe. The UK is, has been set in place, as Minister said, a UK-wide uh, arrangement for genomic sequencing and random sampling of um, isolates on an ongoing basis. Uh, over the last uh, number of months, um, and by comparison to other parts of, of uh, Europe and um, the, indeed the Republic of Ireland, we sequence more in Northern Ireland and in the UK than anywhere else. Um, and I think that's why it's um, undoubtedly the case that we have detected um, this variant, uh, irrespective of where it's arisen. Um, I think that it undoubtedly, because of the travel hub, which has been alluded to throughout um, uh, this morning's uh, committee meeting that this uh, variant is probably more widespread and and more and more other countries uh, uh, than is actually uh, known about at the moment because the harder you will look for it i think that the more you will find okay thank you okay thank you members and thank thank the minister and chief medical officer um just minister if i can take you back to one point in relation to our layers you'd said that there was no off-the-shelf model that we could use legislatively. But I suppose the committee here are routinely um, faced with decisions on a, on a weekly basis in relation to travel where we restrict or we ease travel restrictions from various places. And the most relevant example is probably the Denmark one, where we saw a new strain emerging. There was a lack of clarity about what the impact of that strain would have. And countries very quickly, and I believe very appropriately, moved to stop the travel and allow uh, an assessment to be made of what the impact would be or how that might be managed, and then over a period of time those restrictions were eased again. So why could that example not have been followed very, very straightforwardly in this case? 
Um, I think what, what, there, there's no legislation. I said we could, we could lift, lift straight off the, the shelf chair because what we would have had to have done was, and then again, it was using the 67 Act uh, in regards to curtailing travel within the United Kingdom. Uh, the reference that you make is to your travel regulations um, under the Coronavirus Act for international travel. And those are specifically set up and curtailed and, and designed actually and unspecified uh, for travel or for anybody coming from without uh, the common travel area. So uh, you know we, we, we could have we, we could have I suppose it was making adapt we could make adaptions to what uh, that legislation looked like, but it would have to have been done under the auspices um, of the sixty seven act. Okay, but we, we have we have also seen where regions, even of countries, where you know at times the Greek islands were parts of you know were were stipulated within restrictions. Um, so, so are you are you saying that 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 was essentially it was essentially a political decision in relation to the international element of that? No, no, chair. Sorry, um, for us to introduce travel restrictions within the UK, we were going to have to look at utilising the sixty seven Act. Uh, whereas it came to, you know, you're talking about the Greek islands or the decisions there are all based, based on uh, the, the information, the data that comes forward from JBC. Uh, the, the legislation that's used to do that and implement that is specifically uh, for travel outside the common travel area. So there is no current legislation uh, that actually allows that, you know, travel uh, ban between parts of the United Kingdom that we currently have uh, on, on on record or accessible here in Northern Ireland. So we'd have to start from scratch in development or we could look to you know, other models and other, other pieces of legislation that are currently there to form the basis of it, but there isn't that specific. Okay. Okay, thank you. And um, I suppose I suppose I would like to take the opportunity before we before we say um, good luck to yourselves for now. Um, is to take the opportunity to reiterate the message to the public that we are in a very, very difficult situation. We are facing into a Christmas like no other, and I think we all need to realise that, and we need to take decisions based on the fact that, that this Christmas can't be like any other. Um, there will be other Christmases if we protect each other, if we protect our health service, but it is incumbent on all of us. And I think we all share that same goal, despite the fact that we have differences in terms of how things are done. We all share the goal that we want to protect our population, we want to protect our health services, and we want to deal with this pandemic in the best way we possibly can. I want to thank you both just at this period of time for coming um, today. I think it has been a very useful session, and I think the, the additional time and focus has allowed us to go into more detail in a number of areas, and I think that is useful to consider going forward into the new year. Um, but also, to thank you, Minister, and your, your, the Chief Medical Officer, and your, your team, as I said earlier, your entire uh, leadership team, and for the work and effort you put in, and also to send out a very, very warm message of solidarity to all of our frontline staff who have been working under so much pressure for so long now. I would ask every single member of the public to consider that every time they are taking a decision, as well as considering themselves and their families. Think about how hard health staff have been working here. Do everything you can to do the basics, to maintain social distancing, limit your contacts right down to a bare minimum, washing hands, and all that very basic respiratory hygiene. Um, I, just, I just want to finally wish both of you, Nolig, Hana, Dave, a very, very happy Christmas and a safe and a happy and a peaceful New Year. Or, and, and I hope that the New Year will bring better things for all of us. Chair, um, just in, in finishing, can I thank you um, for those comments. Um, because I have, and look, as a department, we are appreciative of the support um, that we get from the committee. Um, and I think it's a healthy interaction that we have. Um, when I look to when I look to the, the relationship that some other ministers have with with their scrutiny committee, it's not, I think, is uh, constructive as we have, uh, and I thank you for it, because I think one thing that we share is that common interest of support for our health service, uh, the health family, and all the workers in it. 
Uh, and I think if we can keep working together on on that issue, you know, the opportunities that the the, the relationship that we have, um, I think, only can, can continues to strengthen. And I thank you, for Chair, and and your other members for the continued messaging uh, that we put out in regards to the regulations. They're not easy. They're not easy to bring, and I know they haven't been easy to scrutinise. Um, but we've seen uh, back at the start of the year that the real benefits. Um, that they actually brought. So, you know, we, we, we can do this again, we can do it again together. So, Chair, thank you very much uh, again for giving us the opportunity to come today. And can I wish all the committee and your families as well a happy Christmas and a new year. And I think, Chair, we're down to, to come back again. Um, I think it's your second meeting in January because not, not only are these engagements useful uh, for us, uh, I think it's also useful to get that general message out to the people who listen and interact with these committees as well to know exactly what is going on and the questions that are being asked. So again, Chair, thank you for your commitment and happy Christmas. Okay, thank you for that. And, and Chief Medical Officer, do you want to say anything there before we? Uh, well, I'd firstly to, to thank you for the opportunity to come along and answer questions today. Uh, can I can reiterate your, your comments, uh, Chair. You know, please think carefully. You know, we are at the most fragile time of this pandemic. The decisions that you make today, tomorrow, this week and next will make a fundamental difference. Uh, do the right thing, you will save lives. And do the right thing, you will prevent our health service coming under extraordinary pressures in the, in the weeks ahead. Okay. Okay, thank you, Michael, and thank you, thank you, Minister, um, and wish you and your families both a happy <coughs> Christmas. And I am more Agaslan, Agus Tifi Mwij Shiv. We will we will see you again in due course. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Michael. Okay, um, yeah, go ahead. Chair, no, just I want to put on record thanks uh, for you chairing that particular meeting. I think that is probably the most productive. Uh, meeting with a, a CMO and minister that I've, I've been a part of. Um, I didn't feel rushed. I felt that members, I, I learned as much from other members questioning as I did from my own. Um, and I think uh, it is a model to go forward on. Um, and I think the number of participants in relation to just the CMO and the minister with one taking the lead. Uh, and if members wanted to further deviate to, to the other, they could. Um, but certainly given the gravity of the situation that we find ourselves in, it is but only right that we give this due scrutiny. Uh, we, we all will not agree on the approach. Uh, certainly there's plenty of questions to ask, but being given the opportunity to ask them at the committee uh, in, a, in a way such as that, uh, I think was befitting of the scrutiny role that we should be playing. So I would like to put on thanks uh, to you for taking into consideration uh, that additional meeting and the way in which it was conducted. Yeah, and, and I think uh, myself and the clerk have at every at every meeting requested that hour and a half, and I think I think we have understood that there has been huge pressure on, and we, in recognition of that, we have done our best in terms of. But I do think that that is a useful a useful uh, lesson for the future in in terms of of how we uh, how we function in the new year and apply that scrutiny and that advice and uh, role that, that we have to apply. So thank you for that, members. I'm going to move on then to correspondence. Uh, can I refer members to correspondence at tab 5 of your pack uh, and the correspondence memo at tab 5.1? Have members any comments or proposals on any of the correspondence contained? No, nothing then. So are members therefore content with the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Uh, any other business members? Yeah, Pam? Just to say, um, we're technically in, in recess. And so I want to say just a huge thank you to um, Eilish, the clerk, and to all the staff who have facilitated um, this today, because we know that this year has been very challenging for everybody, and that includes our staff, and there's been very little time off for, for, um, for any of them. So we really do appreciate all the fantastic work that, that goes on. There's an incredible amount of work, as we all know, goes on in the background. Um, in terms of uh, making these meetings happen, organising them, organising the witnesses to come, and also uh, a huge amount of work has gone into our inquiry into COVID and the care homes. So, I just want to put on record um, our thanks to all of the staff and wish them a very happy Christmas and safe new year. Yeah, Alan. Sure, I'd like to be associated with, with the rules remarks. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Yes, and I would like to absolutely endorse them. I think I think there has been a tremendous amount of work done by the staff here, um, in very very difficult circumstances, very late minute changes, heavy agendas, a lot of stakeholders to contact, um, and everything being done under pressure. And I would like to absolutely thank every member of the staff. I'd also like to give a very special thanks to the clerk who has guided and, and mentored and, and been available at all times. And I have to say that has been hugely helpful and uh, just the professionalism and the, the support that the entire team has brought to this effort I think has been really tremendous. Um, and I want to wish all of the all of the committee staff a very happy, peaceful and safe Christmas. And members, I would also like to thank every each and every one of you. We have seen, I think, virtually full attendance at nearly every meeting. We have seen Interested engagement. We've seen members who know what they're know what they're 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 seeking to find out, and who are seeking to be constructive, um, and I think that has has shone through a very dark and difficult period. So I want to thank each and every one of you, and to wish each and every one of you, Nolik Hanadiv, a very very happy, peaceful, safe Christmas for you and your families. I sincerely hope that you all get some some rest over this period of time, and I know we're all kind of managing almost on a 24-hour-7 basis at times the issues, rightly, rightly that, that our constituents and sectors are bringing to us, and we'll, we'll I'm sure, continue to do that as best we can, but everyone does need some, some rest at times, and I'm conscious you're right, Pam, we are in recess. We have done this now on Easter, on summer, we have met throughout recess, and I think the situation demanded that, and I think we have... We have, we have risen to that challenge as best we could, so I would like to thank you all for your cooperation in relation to that. Thank you, um, so, members, moving on then to the date, time and place of next meeting. Our next, meeting, our next scheduled meeting, members, and I just do want to be careful, our next scheduled meeting is on 30, 14th of January in the Senate Chamber, when we will be briefed by the Minister and Chief Scientific Advisor. That time is yet to be confirmed, but given the situation, um, that is our next scheduled meeting, and, and hopefully we, when we will next see each other again. Um, but if anything arises in the meantime, if members are content to leave it to the call of the Chair, if, if something arises unforeseen, that we can facilitate that if necessary. So, Nolik Hanadeev, thank you all very much and happy Christmas. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.